Welcome to Public Occurrences, Both Foreign and Domestic. I'm your daily guide for understanding today's headlines, Michael O'Fallon. this past week's withdrawal from Afghanistan of our U.S. forces as the Taliban, the medieval death cult of Central Asia, has been allowed to take control of Kabul and the central government of Afghanistan. You might have been asking the question, why? Why are we allowing this to happen? Afghanistan, if you will recall, is called the Graveyard of Empires. Afghanistan, the land of a people who aren't really sure what freedom looks like. Afghanistan, a land that is bordered by Iran, Pakistan, and toward the northeast, China. If we were to step back several thousand years, you would understand that Afghanistan has quite a bit of important history in understanding our world. Afghanistan between 1800 BC and 1000 BC, gave birth to the ancient religion of Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism has a dualistic cosmology of good and evil, and an eschatology which predicts the ultimate conquest of evil by good. Zoroastrianism exalts an uncreated and benevolent deity of wisdom, Ahura Mazda, in other words, wise lord, as its supreme being. And throughout the Middle East and Western Asia, this belief system had quite an impact in the tribal faiths of the region. If we fast forward a bit, Alexander the Great and his Macedonian forces arrived in Afghanistan in 330 BC after defeating King Darius of Persia. Alexander helped to pave the way and provide the best routes to what would be known as China from the Mediterranean. This eventually led to the emergence of the Silk Road. Now, please, here, pay attention, and don't forget this as we go forward in our talk. The Silk Road, a known navigable route that brought treasures and spices of the East to the West, and the West to the East. And this appeared during the first century BC, and Afghanistan flourished with trade, with routes to China, India, Persia, all the way to Israel and the Mediterranean, and north to the kingdoms and tribes of what is known now as Uzbekistan. Goods and ideas were exchanged at this center point of Afghanistan, such as Chinese silk, Persian silver, and Roman gold, while the region of present Afghanistan was mining and trading lapis lazuli stone. Muslim conquests in the 7th century ended Persian rule, and then this led to a period of Islamic dominance, until Genghis Khan and the Mongols invaded the region in 1219 AD and wiped out what has been estimated to be as much as 15 million people in the area. And although this was a difficult area to settle, about 100 years later, Muslim rule returned, and civility was brought to many regions of Afghanistan, with Shah Rukh and the Timurid Empire creating something akin to the Italian Renaissance, the Timurid Renaissance, which saw a return of culture, art, and learning to the region. Well, after several hundred years of Islamic tribal rule, eventually the wars and conquests that brought both the British and German forces to the area created tension and eventual nation-building in Afghanistan. King Khan eventually declared Afghanistan a sovereign and independent state. Following a 1927-28 to tour of Europe and Turkey, he introduced several reforms intended to modernize his nation, and a key force behind these reforms was Mahmoud Tarzi, an ardent supporter of the education of women. He fought for what was called Article 68 of Afghanistan's 1923 constitution, which made elementary education compulsory 
The institution of slavery was abolished in 1923 in Afghanistan as well. Yes, slavery was around in Afghanistan up until 1923 in strength and, of course, has now returned. King Zahir Shah ruled Afghanistan from 1933 until a bloodless coup took him out in 1973 and Daoud Khan became the first president of Afghanistan. Now, please take note, at this time Afghanistan, while Muslim, was still on the rather modern side of things. An economy had started, in particular fueled by the opium trade. Education was important to the nation, and for the most part, the culture and way of dress for everyone was rather contemporary. But in 1978, while my personal main concern at that time was Star Wars, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan seized control of Afghanistan. The Democratic Party of Afghanistan was a Marxist-Leninist group of revolutionaries, and everything was thrown into complete chaos. This then would trigger a series of events that would dramatically turn Afghanistan from a poor and secluded but peaceful country, and it had been peaceful for years, into a hotbed of international terrorism. The PDPA initiated various social symbolic land distribution reforms that provoked strong opposition, while also brutally oppressing political dissidents. Maybe you didn't know that. The actions by the PDPA, again a Marxist-Leninist group, caused unrest and quickly expanded into a state of civil war by 1979, waged by a guerrilla Mujahideen and similar Maoist guerrillas against regime forces countrywide. I hope you're starting to get the picture here. It quickly turned into a proxy war as the Pakistani government provided these rebels with covert training centers. The United States supported them through Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, in other words, known as the ISI. And the Soviet Union sent thousands of military advisors to support the Marxist-Leninist PDPA regime that was controlling Afghanistan at the time. There is a history in Afghanistan that is longer than the Taliban and the radical Muslims that control it. Meanwhile, there was increasingly hostile friction between the competing factions of the PDPA. They were starting to work against each other. And let's make a very long story short. There was another assassination. The Soviet Union jumped into action to protect its investment of the Marxist-Leninist group. And then the United States, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and China, strangely, decided to support radical Islamic rebels to fight against the Marxist-Leninist PDPA. Now, there was, of course, massive conflict. The Soviet Union just absolutely got stuck in, stuck in a quagmire. There was no way that they could save face and win at the same time. So the Soviets withdrew. And after the Soviets withdrew, the PDPA collapsed and another civil war began. This time, eventually won by the rebels that were trained, financed, and supplied by the United States, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and China. And then came the harsh and radical rule of the Taliban, who coddled the rulers of what was soon to become Al-Qaeda. And all of these previously trained and were financed by the United States. Then several years later, September 11th, 2001 happened. And of course, you know what happened from there. We bombed and invaded Afghanistan. We went to war with the Taliban. We took over major airports and cities of Afghanistan in the next year. We went to war in the mountains of Afghanistan with the Taliban. But then we did something else. We brought liberty to the Afghan people, which was well received. But within about five years, our focus went from winning the war in Afghanistan 
to nation building and creating civilizational change in Afghanistan, to then attempting to centralize populations in Afghanistan. And that was meant to eliminate tribalism in Afghanistan and to eventually bring radical feminism suggested to Afghanistan. And in 2012, Demet Sadat, a former professor of political science at American University of Afghanistan, mobilized the LGBT movement. And on August 22nd, 2013, he became the first public figure to come out as gay and campaign for gender freedom and sexual liberation in Afghanistan. Now, as you can imagine, this was not well received for the most part in Afghanistan. And of course, the United States was blamed for bringing in and normalizing sexual immorality in Afghanistan. Now, I say that even though the practice known as Bakabazi is still prevalent in parts of northern Afghanistan, and that practice involves teenage boys being dressed in women's clothing and made to participate in dance competitions to engage in sexual acts. That's actually happening and still continues on there. So now, the United States pushed a centralized government idea in Afghanistan. So in other words, they're trying to do in Afghanistan what they're planning to do here several years later, or have been trying to do in terms of gentrification, these other ideas of creating one large hub city to be able to have full control of things, full control of data, eliminate necessarily what you would call suburbs or rural areas, get rid of tribal factions, but centralize the population. And then they pushed Hamid Karzai as president. And later he was replaced by Ashrif Ghani. And then everyone began to really take notice and to get involved, namely the World Economic Forum. So now everybody and all the NGOs were into the act and trying to make Afghanistan an open society. So now the NGOs and the World Economic Forum were trying to dissuade car usage, promote bicycle usage, and transportation to protect the environment, encourage progressive ideals in education, and then end up creating an ideological stew in the large population centers of Afghanistan. So now you fast forward to 2020, and President Trump states that it is time to start withdrawing from Afghanistan. The military brass, of course, were completely freaking out. Social society engineers started to freak out. This was their laboratory over the last 15 years. And then unwisely, Joe Biden, who really doesn't have any clue what is going on, began a gradual withdrawal of the troops, but without really a strategic plan in place. And with no real concern for the disastrous situation that they just created. So now the Taliban begins to reemerge. They are all well equipped all of a sudden. And U.S. troops continue to withdraw at a rapid pace. Really an inexcusably sloppy pace. And then, predictably, China begins to pay quite a bit of attention to Afghanistan. You see, the last time the Taliban were in power, they turned Afghanistan into a virtual pariah state, isolated from the rest of the world, save for Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, the only governments willing to really recognize them. But in the last few weeks, I could really say the last two months, top Taliban leaders have been on a whirlwind international tour, visiting Iran, Russia, and China. You see, for the last 12 years or so, at least when I knew that I was brought into China's plans, China has decided to build back. Remember that what we were talking about before in the earlier portion of the program? They decided to build back that old Silk Road from about 2,000 years ago. Oh, but make it much, much broader. And really one way. And in 2011, they decided to call it 
the Belt and Road Initiative, or the One Belt, One Road. We've talked about this extensively before on the causes of things in the last three years. One Belt, One Road. One Belt to rule them all. It's neocolonization. It is debt diplomacy. And of course, to prevent any conflict, they bring up the law now of Thucydides' trap. We don't want to have conflict happen. We just need to make sure that we're negotiating these things. And one nation they didn't have. One nation between China and their goal of getting to the Mediterranean and then to Europe. One nation that they did not have was Afghanistan. It's one of the primary reasons why America was there. Now, what China does to nations all over Asia and Africa and other areas is that China comes in and promises big investments in energy and infrastructure projects, including the building of a road network, let's say, in Afghanistan, and is also eyeing the country's vast, untapped, rare earth mineral deposits. You know, and Beijing was already reportedly preparing to formally recognize the Taliban before the group seized control of the country. So China plans on spending billions and billions of dollars in Afghanistan. But all of this comes to Afghanistan for a price. You need to do what China wants, whatever they want. You need to let China bring in whatever business from China that it wants to. Because most importantly, as you plan for the fourth industrial revolution, the one thing you need more than all of that, you need to make sure that all of Afghanistan's data runs through China. And this is why George Soros wasn't too pleased with this turn of events in Afghanistan. Instead of remarking about Afghanistan today and what's happening today, Mr. Soros instead tweeted this today. Quote, I consider Xi Jinping the most dangerous enemy of open societies in the world. End quote. And you know what? George is right. China is a massive, racist, hegemonic, closed society and it is about to take control of Afghanistan. And if China is successful in continuing with the Belt and Road Initiative, the One Belt, One Road Project, and with all the nations that will be involved with this, that will become puppet states of China, it will create a gigantic, closed, hegemonic, racist society that China will dominate. And the U.S. is pulling out, ingloriously, like a beaten dog, with people clinging to the wheels of our planes, with people being executed in the streets as we leave. And the reason that we can do this so coldly and walk away from it after 20 years and after having these people trust us is because in the minds of the technocrats that are pulling the strings and that are making the decisions, especially in Washington, D.C., we are just data to the new world powers. And as the new world powers negotiate and position themselves for the future, you are just a negotiated number. Now, there will be tens of thousands of Afghanis transported in the United States, Canada, and the UK over the next month. We won't really know who these people are. And of course, we will have millions of people pouring through our southern borders, and we won't know who they are either. And there will likely be an additional terror attack in the United States, maybe several, which will mean demanded increased surveillance, both physical and digital. Because, as you have already been told, the American people are the actual terror threat to the new world. We're the most loyal and patriotic to a nation 
have now become the threat to the new supranation. You see, that's where your allegiance needs to be. The new supranation. And that's where the conflict lies. That is where the U.S. needs to have its troop presence. But there is hope. U.S. troops are able to see what's kind of going on. Americans can see that the U.S. military can create borders and move massive amounts of equipment worldwide at a whim. And yet we are not protecting our own nation. And we can win the battle of ideas if we speak up. And speak up now with courage and conviction to save the United States of America and preserve at least one beacon of freedom for the world. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and I will see you next time on Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. Thank you.